Good morning, it is Ralph, and we are going to be talking data analytics, a reference to SARS-CoV-2, or in layman's terms, COVID-19. Right off the bat, let's begin. Number one, I'm using a new video recorder, so this should all be far clearer than we have been using before. I'm using Loom, and that is me in my plague mask from the Middle Ages, and there's an analogy to that, but regardless of that, right off the bat, polysorbate 80, CDC, I watched the uh basically the conference last night or the news uh, news conference wait do not get the mRNA vaccine it's a large risk and the CDC recommends potentially waiting for another vaccine number two if you're allergic to polyethylene glycol in reference to the mRNA vaccine according to the Centers for Disease Control do not vaccinate polyethylene glycol so part of the uh, of the news conference that was discussed to say, well, why did this not come out in reference to the prior trials? Well, one of the researchers brought up a very good point. The researcher said, number one, if people tend to have bad reactions to vaccines, they're most likely not going to volunteer for a trial. So that's something to take in mind before vaccine mandates are basically applied or um, entertained in the thoughts of bureaucrats. If people which are allergic to vaccines or have reactions to vaccines are not in the trials, can you mandate people to take vaccines without being unknowns? But regardless of that, polysorbate 80, precautionary, and polyethylene glycol, according to the CDC, no. And again, other vaccines are coming out if those really want a vaccine. In April, I like the AstraZeneca one, even though there's some questions reference to the trials as well. Uh, and we're referencing the dose in the vaccine itself, but it's a vector, not an mRNA. And that means a look-alike to SARS-CoV-2, which tends to uh, basically elicit a strong immune response. But let us begin. Let's get right to the beginning. This is incredibly intriguing in reference to mesenchymal cells and SARS-CoV-2. All right, here we go. University of Miami leads groundbreaking trial for COVID-19 treatment. Now, I know it sounds kind of macabre, we're talking from umbilical cords, but wait and read. Let us begin. All right, let's go to the next page. You have to read through this. The paper describes findings for 24 patients hospitalized at University of Miami, da, 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 uh, with COVID-19 who developed severe acute respiratory distress syndrome. Each received two infusions given days apart of, mesen uh, of either mesenchymal cells or a placebo. I want to reiterate, as in just two, period, the entire trial. It was a double-blind study. Doctors and patients did not know who, what was infused. Two infusions of 100 million stem cells were delivered within three days for a total of 200 million cells in each subject in the treatment group. Researchers found that the treatment was safe with no infusion-related serious adverse events. Patient survival at one month was 91% in the stem cell treated group versus 42% in the control group. Among patients younger than 85, it was 100% survival. All right, that is not even the most intriguing part of the research, but let's proceed forward. Dr. Ricordo and colleagues found that time of recovery was faster among those in the treatment arm. More than half the patients treated with mesenchymal stem cell infusions recovered and went home from the hospital within two weeks after the last treatment. More than 80% of the treatment group recovered by day 30 versus 37 in the control group. I want to reiterate, this was a double randomized, double blind study if it was doctors and patients did not know. This part is amazing. Here we go. The umbilical cord contains progenitor cells, stem cells, a mesenchymal stem cells. I want to say mesenchymal so bad, but mesenchymal stem cells that can be expanded and provide therapeutic doses for over 10 thousand patients from a single umbilical cord think about that i want to pause Ten thousand patients can be treated from one single umbilical cord potentially increasing survival rate of those 85 or younger to a hundred percent just two infusions as well as basically decrease time in the hospital dramatically is a unique resource that Adonis so forth 
and collaborating with China and type 1 diabetes. Use it for a lot of different things and currently being used over 260 clinical studies. Now, again, I'll have the links for the research articles and so on and so forth that you can follow on your own. But let that sink in. One umbilical cord, 10,000 patients. Incredible, incredible uh, survival time in the treated group greatly reduced hospital time as well just with two treatments given three days apart. Amazing. Why is that that headline news? So many things that we covered that have been groundbreaking research reference to science just seems to fall flat. The greatest, greatest example of selection bias ever seen in the scientific community as far as the bureaucrats and the media picking and choosing the most difficult outcomes in reference to resolving the pandemic, which should have been resolved a long time ago. Now, next one is kind of interesting. I want you to imagine how this plays a role in the psychology of the pandemic. And plus, it's just overall amazing period. Here we go. Social transmission of pain and fear has different targets of mouse brains. This is going to enlighten you a little bit in reference to human behavior as well. Social contact can transfer the feeling of pain or fear in several animal species, including humans. And they wanted to study the exact mechanism. The transfer of fear uh, to find out the distinct neural circuits involved in empathy. Kind of like telepathy, but you're transferring fear. Again, let your own imagination run in reference to basically current events and how that can play a role. We can have two people which want to have, or two groups of people that want to have a positive outcome in reference to a certain event or a trial and tribulation. Yet the anger, the fear, the hatred, the polarization is so strong, people don't even know why they're angry anymore. But it's a positive note to that as well, too. They showed how pain and fear can be socially transferred between affected and bystander mice. The study also demonstrates for the first time that pain relief via analgesic drug can be transferred socially. So what that means is kind of weird. Don't get the wrong impression. Let me finish the, the, the read it to fully too. Uh, the pain relief via analgesic drug can be transferred socially, possibly offering an interesting model for socially induced pain relief among humans. So if someone's feeling really, really, really good, that can be contagious, which is kind of interesting because if you think of a performer or someone you say has stage presence or has presence when they walk into a room, it, what are you actually feeling? Is that a transfer of emotion or empathy uh, that certain individuals may be able to transfer empathy uh, at a greater extent of efficiency in reference to COVID pandemics and pandemic planning and you know, basically the overall selection bias or biases that you can't explain internally or people deciding which information to read and not read that basically comforts them, there may be actually some truth to what we consider thought leaders, people that actually think for people in certain ways. But that's a whole, uh, I don't want to dive how do you describe them? You know, I don't want to veer from course. So let's begin and next uh, the next picture just to give you an idea. So pain. I love the pictures here. Social transfer. Uh, but the analgesia, uh, the analgesia effect when they give morphine, the bystander mice actually had a reduction in pain around the morphine intoxicated mice. Uh, even when the mice had shock in the foot, and again, this is an animal model. I'm not into animal experimentation, but just to give you an idea, uh, if they got shocked, the bystander began to feel the outcome of that shock as well. Interesting. Really, really intriguing. Apply that to basically a lot of the dynamics in the pandemic model that we have, not the model as far as fighting the pandemic, but the behavioral modifications and the behavioral engineering and social engineering that is occurring that may be causing things to go awry and we don't understand why because people are directly affected by other people's pain. They feel their pain and they feel their joy. Everyone's scared and terrified, even those which are not really concerned about the COVID-19, for example, may also feel the, the 
the fear and the terror that another individual may feel justified or not. But to proceed as follows. This plays into the next article. Experts tap into behavioral research to promote COVID-19 vaccination in the United States. I'm just going to read you one excerpt. And again, these are researchers. Please do not bemoan the researchers. They're being paid to do a job. And you understand the manipulation that gets uh, incorporated into, again, the pandemic model. The pandemic model is more than just disease mitigation. We know from the very beginning, from the new normal, uh, and also to flatten the curve, how much of it was actually behavioral engineering. But here we go. This is reference to the vaccines. This is the strategies they're going to utilize to get people vaccinated. With the pro-vaccine, anti-vaccine, safe vaccine, so on and so forth, you got to recognize the manipulation. And so, for example, saying the war against COVID is a term which is meaning, uh, which basically one can explain our interview are not weak doses of the virus, but instead are instruction manuals that teach the immune system how to defend itself. Simplify. Analogy. All right. Two, increase observability. Uh, Frontline hero on vaccinated America honors our veterans on vaccinated. All right. Distinct digital badges of honor and social media frames. This one you already see taking place. All right. Whether you can rationalize it being true or not, the fact is it is opportunistic. Leverage natural scarcity. In consumer markets, scarcity often signals exclusivity and prompts greater interest or desirability. Now, ask yourself, do you see that being advertised in the media? What's the motivation? Now that it's part of a game that increases desirability, is that information actually accurate or not? Or a certain bureaucrats attempting to hold back on a vaccine to create this exclusivity. You need to know. You don't have to like what I say or how I say it, but again, you have to understand the strategies which are incorporated. And of course, to the, the middle of the road thing saying the key to avoid depicting vaccination in the most extreme action, the range of choices. So you can say one shot, two shot, shot in the middle. They describe how they have a, a medium size between small and large medium, how most people charge the medium, the psychology behind that. And next, the CDC. CDC is actually, I mean, yeah, I, I know a lot of people dislike the CDC, but you know what? You have to at least view them and appears the researchers that I see at the CDC, not the ones, you know, making the pandemic planning per se, but the ones which are actually the, the foot soldiers of the CDC seem to be doing a pretty decent job. All right. And they do seem to be highly concerned. Whether the bureaucrats or not, whether the politicians or not, I think they're not very um, socially aware or or have very poor situational awareness. They see everything compartmentalized. That's my personal feeling. But most of the people at the CDC, the foot soldiers, are actually trying to do their best. But here we go. This was released a few days ago. As important as vaccines are to the whole game, you're not going to see a lot of views. And we're going to review that in a second, too. 1,732 views, January 7th, 2021, when it was released. Maybe updated a little bit since then. But this is important to know. The, these are the reactions. What caught my attention here is potentially anaphylactic or allergic reactions. The first sign or symptom, feeling of impending doom. That, let's make this, the feeling of impending doom is bizarre. But these are the symptoms to look out for. And the reason being is because there are certain areas or certain things you can report vaccine reactions to. In this game, if you really, really, really want to get vaccinated and you want to be that frontline individual that jumps in, if you have a reaction, report it. You could save someone else's life just the same, one way or the other. Interesting enough, I've not seen the reaction. Did not cover the second dose reactions during the meeting, so the press conference. But regardless of that, this is some of the side effects to look for. And I wanted to make a note, and that's on the CDC site, which, you know, obviously has more views than I do, but still just the same. I would have expected more. And of course, we go here, and that's the precautions of vaccinations. These are not commonly diagnosed allergies, polyethylene glycol and polysorbate. 
So if you are concerned, these don't play so much of a role in it. But if you're concerned, it's probably not ideal to get tested ahead of time. Again, because people that have reactions to vaccines, according to the CDC, are people are most likely not going to volunteer for a trial in reference to vaccines. Make sense? I hope so. All right, let's get right into the data. Oh, let me close this out real fast because I want to see one thing. Uh, ooh, that's going to be interesting. We'll go back to that in a second. All right, important. Reaction to vaccines, vaccine adverse event reporting system. They made it really easy. Go to the site right here. Whoops, and oh, he's talking. Ah, no, stop. I ah, forget it. There. All right. All right, that brings in the next thing. Here it goes. All right. So, so I had this window up anyways. I wasn't planning on showing it. This is the alternate reality. All right, so here you go right here. What are we reading right here since I have the screen open? From reimbursement landscape challenges to dwindling patient volumes, many factors lead to hospitals to shut down in recent months. Let's read that again. From reimbursement landscape challenges to dwindling patient volumes amid the COVID-19 pandemic, many hospitals are in a fragile financial position. This brought my attention when first I found out that California was closing down one of its primary hospitals during the pandemic and then complaining at the same time they don't have enough ICU beds. Now, you think this is truly a state of emergency. Someone will go, hey, you know what? Instead of you know calling in a military hospital ship and building these 10 cities and everything else like that, just, you have a hospital. It's got the beds. Why are you shutting it down? Well, an interesting news story, for example, brought attention in reference to L.A., Workers just decided to go to the hospital one day, and the hospital was shut down. And this is during the pandemic. This is just fairly recent. This article, obviously, was December 9, 2020. And these are the 21 hospitals have been closed since January 1st. Here we go. Even though I don't have the articles there, Donald, we're going post, ex post factor a lot. But here we look. California, for example. Now, think about this. In the beginning of the pandemic, this kind of throws me just for uh, a curveball. In April, the, the hospital, which was bankrupt, was purchased by a billionaire. Obviously, he just shut it down recently. Think about that time, too. So basically, this an individual in April buys a hospital that's gone bankrupt. He's an MD. He's an owner of, what should I repeat again, the Los Angeles Times. Now, could you see... Any conflict of interest of an individual who happens to own a newspaper during a pandemic that happens to own a hospital, so on and so forth, and then they shut it down supposedly for renovations, right, just a little while ago. And just another side note, too. Let's see if I go down this one real fast. This is the one. Da, 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 the hospitals. Uh, da, da, da. That's not the one I was looking for. But just to – oh. 15 hospitals laying off workers. All right, this was December 8th. Again, it's really like an alternate reality from what we hear on the news and what the business world is experiencing. Now, obviously, it could be problems with payments and so on and so forth, but you're laying off workers during the pandemic and at the same time complaining you don't have enough people to help with the pandemic. You're complaining you don't have enough beds and IC units Yet, for whatever reason, you're closing hospitals down. And then on top of that, let's go for this one. This is obviously during the pandemic and little ad. Yep, close it. Boom. 32 hospitals file for bankruptcy during, you know, the pandemic. Now, is there payments or whatever it comes down to be? You would think if this is a national priority, you would find ways to keep your medical establishments open. It's just bizarre. Totally bizarre. Even if it's bankrupt, and from a business standpoint, if it was a government takeover, I mean, obviously the government does everything. They're taking over your freaking life, telling you who you could see, who you can't see, who you could travel, what you could wear in your face mask. What you could wear. It's a face mask and a mace, a face and a mask put together, or whatever you could wear on your mace. Uh, but otherwise, outside of that, it's just amazing, confounding logic. But here it goes. 32 hospitals fire for bankruptcies. The, you, the government could have came in and said, hey, you know what? We're going to finance you. Don't close down. Lives are important. Let's show it this way. Boom, boom, boom. 
Uh, again, if you have a good answer for it, I don't know uh, why we spend so much money on other projects, yet the, what we need the most, we just seem to forget about. Again, your call is as good as mine. All I can do is just speculate. Uh, let's get right into data analytics as we follow. Some interesting data this time. All right, let's go do, 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 right for those not experienced with data analytics. A little detailed, but, oh, here it is, COVID states. I want to show you Florida. All right, the do, 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 numbers, 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 scary for a lot of people. These are data frames for people not experienced with that. All right, and positive per 100,000. Look, South Dakota dropped all of a sudden. Do, 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 do. California's on the rise of California. With all lockdowns and quarantines and curfews, uh, just prior to the process of dysbiosis, California has really done the worst out of all of them. There should be no kudos for a person instituting martial law, practically, or dark age pandemic mitigation policies and destroying many of the businesses of California, yet seems to be totally, everything they do is all guesswork. And then when it doesn't work, they say, well, it would have been worse if we didn't do it. Yeah, we've heard that many times before. Digital mortality increases over time. Uh, this is from October to January. Positive per 100,000. Guess California. And look at Florida. Remember, the media, that was kind of scary. Still, you know, you can look at right there. But all of a sudden, the real part about it is this. When, when something positive happens, from an example, let's say, of Florida, which reduced a lot of its lockdown policies, you don't hear a word about it. So it's like having that... Uh, you know, that relative over to your house that all they do 24-7 is complain. Here we go. California, boom, 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 boom. And there's Florida again, desperate uh, 100,000. There's New York. Y yeah, you, again, if you're, cor if, you're, if you're an alien from another world and you're trying to um, conduct an experiment, you need a control group. And this is what we're using right now is we're using Florida as that control. And if Florida is the control, you probably could not get, uh, you know, a good bearing whether the pandemic is actually uh, lockdowns and making a difference. I mean, you can't say they don't uh, with full uh, confidence, but at the same time, too, you can't uh, prove the null hypothesis either, meaning you can't prove that pandemics are doing anything. All right, so here we go. Death increases per 100,000. There's Florida. Oh, look, there's Florida. All right, and uh, obviously there's our other two part partners, uh, Florida, New York, and California. There's, well, look, Florida. All right, hospitalizations per 100,000. Oh, look, there's Florida. And let's see, we go down here. Do, 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 positive increases per state. If you want to look at it from that aspect, just recently, there's California, and there's Florida. It's Texas. Be fair, but at New York, North Carolina, but Florida's not doing a lockdown. And we're talking, you know, we're talking apples per apples as far as per 100,000. Think about it. You know, I would like to say it's the vitamin D level because of California has sunshine too, unless most of our Californians here are staying indoors. Uh, Florida, now think about this too. All the dire predictions of all the people celebrating during New Year's Eve. How embarrassing because all those epidemiologists and talking heads on TV, data is an incredible, incredible enlightener in reference to truth. And if they're that wrong that often, why is anybody listening to them now? All right, and proceed as forward. Boo, 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 doo, doo, doo. Oh, that was it. One. All right, let's get back to the data analytics. Let's go to COVID states testing. Let's real fast. Again, I just ran this data for the first time. Let's just scroll down. Uh, to speed things up, positive to mortality. This must be the states. Those are cool numbers that make you look really smart when you scroll the picture down like that. It's a heat map, makes you look really smart too. See? All right. Test result to correlation. Again, test results to correlation, the best predictor ever of mortality, which makes absolutely no sense. We're talking not testing, we're talking test results, which include negatives and positives. For whatever reason, and no one seems to be paying attention, the correlation is extremely strong and it's creepy. So, for example, right now, let's see, look at this. I put this in there so you don't have to wait for the other graphs. I said, what, 36 million tests? 
we would be estimated between 29,767 and 28,348 mortalities. Uh, 36 million tests. Now I sound like Biden. All right, but otherwise, too, test of mortality. Uh, currently, we're at this one, 335,353,348. And the mortality rate, unfortunately, at 29,233. So at Thirty-six million tests. I estimate will be between. Not I estimate the slope to this correlation is so incredibly uh, connected that basically I can say it's going to be somewhere between there and there. And guess what? Not I don't want to say I haven't been wrong yet, but the data has not been wrong yet. All right, so let's go here. Do 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 stuff. Do you see? There's your correlations. See, it's going back up to that line again. Correlation. Uh, da, da, da. Let's see positive test results going down. These things you don't want these squares, really exciting. All these squares really makes you fun at parties. Da, da, da. Population stuff. Heat map is the US. That's a mess up. Don't pay attention to that. Uh, these are the states with the highest correlations North Carolina, Virginia, and Georgia. So we're going to look at these top three right here because that's almost a one correlation, the test results to mortality rate. Now that's including the negatives and the positive to mortality rate. Again, I don't know why. Just say you live in the matrix and you can be great friends with Elon Musk. All right, here we are. Look at the correlation. There's your correlations down the line. And there is that. And as you see, so there's a mess up. What state's this? I'll just go down to the states. This is probably the first one, North Carolina. See total test results to total test results, which makes sense to be a one. Uh, if it wasn't, there'd be a problem. Total test results to death, one. There's your correlations again. And what you'd expect to be correlating doesn't seem to do, does not seem to correlate as well. In ICU to death, 0.84, which makes sense. But total test results to death, that's bizarre. All right, so we go down the line. Let's look at that. You see that? We just covered that before. I'm going to speed through for expediency because I know the lines are really boring. I'll stop at the mortality percentage per positive. That's the increase there. It's going down, going up a little bit. Uh, and then there's an easy heat map, thrill, Virginia. There's that. Mortality to percentage positive, Virginia. Really nice heat map. But look, total test results to death. Yeah, you see what it, it's bizarre. Positive to death is is still lower than the correlation of the total test results in death. So I'm going to let you speculate why that is. Georgia, because no one's been able to explain it to me yet at all. And I don't have an answer. Positive increase, the hospitalization currently. Now, again, that's per thousand, I believe. And so total deaths to test results, there's your correlation. Uh, da, 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 da. Basically, mortality per positive, down. Uh, total test results to death, Georgia, odd. California, again, you all see where this is going because we've seen it before. This dance is just really, really uh, in line with each other continuously. So, I mean, you see a lot more positives Obviously, and it looks like the hospitalization uh, currently goes down. But when you break it down to a certain uh, device, or let's say per thousand, and you keep or hundred thousand or whatever, you it's you get this weird pattern that begins to form, which is really amazing because it makes you think: Well, are, is our hospitalizations better or our treatment better? Maybe it's because you're really just finding a lot more asymptomatic individuals, and your treatments are pretty much close to what they were in the beginning. Uh, even though we learned a lot about ice ventilators and stuff like that, like we're going to run out and all this other stuff, which obviously we found out after a while, that mechanical ventilation may not have been the best option. All right, mortality percentage per positive increase, a little bit higher, bounced up. That's California. It's very dark, dark, dark heat map. Biden will like that. Dark. And so here it is, total test results to death. Dropped a little bit, not as bad as the other states, but still just the same. Boom, dark. New York, weird 
different pattern. Again, they say there's a super strain out there now to increase transmissibility. I want to see that out. It's very convenient the new strain that has a higher transmission rate should come out the exact same time the vaccines come out. Now, not correlating one with the other directly, but it makes it very difficult. Where the vaccines were failing or did not work as well as they should, it's easy just to blame on the new super variant, the super strain. It's No, that's not cool. But I found a way around that. I'm going to show you that in a second. All right, here we go. That's Florida. Uh, you notice the difference uh, in the positive increase there and the hospitalization, a greater gap than the other two, uh, uh, New York and uh, California. And there it is. And the mortality percentage per positive increase, the drop. And Florida is in the green. Again, these are random colors in the heat maps and patterns, just the way it is. Total test results of deaths still very high. And you, you, know, you can see where, for example, positive to death and so on and so forth. You can see how the correlation is. For those not familiar, the closer you are to a one, the stronger the relationship. For those that are not experienced correlation, once you get down to, let's say, total test results, I think, to look at this, and positive increase is 0.37. All right, that's that's what makes this really weird too at the same time. But once you go to this to that, and you so the correlation is really not that strong in total test results. Uh, yeah, and now look at this. What the heck is going on there? And so I want to find out for reference to the numbers to make sure that's an anomaly. And then not to find because it's broken. All right, so let's go back. Let's go back to the new thing we're going to be doing real, real shortly. Let's first run the hospitalization occupancy. You got to put your politicians to tasks. This is your total inpatient beds, inpatient beds, use estimate, inpatient beds, used uh, COVID estimate. So, for example, here's California, here's Florida, uh, which ironically, this is a total. This is not a percentage, this is a total. So, and you know, there's other states too. Look at Florida. It's like it has tons of it beds. Uh, its inpatient bed use is far lower, but again, its population is less. But still, it's, you know, it's probably where people go to retire. Texas, da da da, Puerto Rico, and people that didn't make the radar yet we'll check that well i didn't check the international stuff yet uh, icu beds icu beds estimate uh so the number of beds available now keep in mind when we look at the the, the new uh the line graph and line chart you see these icu beds go up and down up and down as far as the number of it if hospitals are going bankrupt and things like that and closing the doors and so on and so forth you're going to have less icu beds and you're going to have that little drop there in the curve we'll check that in a second uh Remember, 72, 76%, basically, I think I put it at 72, just to be fair, uh, is your average hospital utilization. Uh, so these states right here, for example, are California, Nevada is a little bit above the norm. Georgia, for example, is really high above the norm. Uh, but they're not necessarily full. And again, that could be cute. That could be uh, also... You know, pediatric ICU and so on and so forth as far as ICU beds which adults can't use. And so a lot of states, for example, are way below average occupancy. So it's something to think about as far as average occupancy on a national level. So let's proceed down. Patient and bed utilization, patient ICU bed utilization. Uh, that's probably a little too small for you to read, so I'm going to pass that over. But they, I put it on a um, sort from... I think largest in reference to ICU bed uh, in percentage of inpatient bed utilization uh, overall, and that was Rhode Island at the top, and California's down here in Arizona, and you go all the way down to Wyoming, and you know the Northern Mariana Islands, and so we go down there, and let's go a few down here. See what I left out here. All right, here's your chart. So you see this ICU bed utilization, or inpatient beds available, which is the blue line. And every once in a while, you see a drop. Well, if they close a hospital down due to bankruptcy or lay off workers and have people demand those, those inpatient beds, you're going to see a variation. But there's California. Uh, definitely has an increase in beds used for COVID. Uh, inpatient beds used right there. So here's your inpatient. Remember, this is over a, a state level. So here, it looks like you have a lot of beds, and but you're not anywhere near all those beds being used. And this is not the ICU, this is beds overall. 
So this is what I see. And I went back to May, but we, I would like to go before May, but we really didn't start keeping track of this data until May. So now we got it. What happened here? I have no clue. Probably because they shut down a lot of things because of, um, at that time, I think COVID was dropping pretty low, even though you have an increase in beds being used for COVID during a time when you had a pretty strong drop overall. All right, here's our columns, New York. Inpatient beds are going up. Inpatient beds used are going up. What a reason. Again, I'm just working with data from the U.S. government or health uh, data, government dot dot, whatever it is. Inpatient beds uh, here, Florida. Now, again, if they don't need the beds, they may lay off workers or whatever it comes down to be because uh, COVID is not a, you know, as a concern. So the bed, beds being able to be uh, manned or uh, manned, apologize, staffed. I want to be politically correct in that reference, or not as many. So, but however, look at this. This is the inpatient beds being used, which could be carefully monitored at the same time too, because you're bringing people in for elective surgeries and things like that. And there's your your data frame as far as that's concerned. You want to see the numbers? Do 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 do. All right, now we come to the next part. This is how, how we're going to keep track of whether the vaccines are actually in a very, very weak, but still a form of correlation, which is stronger than when our bureaucrats are utilizing to um, manage the pandemic. But you'll see why in a second. All right, what I'm doing here is I'm using the health.gov site again from the CDC. And what we're doing is we're looking at vaccine delivery rates. And we're going to be looking at the second dose. So the second dose used in each area. The reason the second dose is because we could draw an assumption, provided some pharmacist they don't leave it out of their desk, or some governor is trying to make things appear exclusive by restricting availability initially and then just releasing it all at once, per se. No governors that potentially start with a C in their last name doing anything like that? None. Can't be. All right, but otherwise, outside of that, here we go. We're going by the second dose, because second dose most often means administered. And this is the mRNA vaccine. As we get the AstraZeneca one, in April, I think it's geared for, then we'll add that one too. So looking at the doses, 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 don't pay attention to that. That's just give an idea. All right, this is your data frame, second dose, the shipments. You go down the line, this is the 14th. And then the second dose, for example, looking at the 10th here. So I assume they want to, they want to do their homework ahead of time because today is the 10th at 129 a.m. But you never know. It could be uh, issued ahead of time. But there's your dose rate. And for example, this is California. Pretty st amount, you know, look at the dose administered on the second dose. It's pretty st stable, except for this one time on the 21st of uh, December, which you'll see. And uh, it's pretty much across the board. It's, even if you pick random, let's see. Uh, yeah, it's pretty stable, except the one month, or one week, I should say, the 21st of December, they just vaccinated the heck out of everything, and then back down. All right, you see, there we are. And then we look at different sets there. Da, da, da. Completed vaccine administration. This is numerical. Remember, this is uh, scientific notation. So looking at 40 million here, looking at 5 million there. So it's not like it's 500,000. Don't get confused in that. Population, uh, of the population and current total of the number of the population vaccinated. And this was last updated on the 4th. So again, close. I have to go, the only data we have available is it's reported weekly, so probably not gonna get reported again until Monday. Uh, let's see, this is the allocation, the second dose each shipments currently overall. And so that makes sense in a second. There's your population, I'm just merging data frames, looking at the last updates. We're doing the math here. We're doing the percentage of the population vaccinated each state. We're going to go to a data frame. I'll show that in a second. And here we are. Hospital to vaccine comparison. What we're doing is comparing the patients in bed utilization, percentage of inpatient bed utilization, percentage of ICU beds utilized, and the vaccine level, meaning the percentage of the population vaccinated. So this is what we want to monitor over the coming weeks to see if we notice any true drop in that ICU administration. So here's California. It's about 85% of the ICU beds are being used. And as a percentage of the population, 
there we are there and here's New York again you can question the vac what they're doing with the vaccine I don't know but however though they're pretty low on the chart uh, in reference to even being at the average range of IC bed and inpatient bed utilization and all the way down the line if you see your state there hopefully I'm not blocking the people from Alabama which they have a high I mean Alabama has one of the highest percent IC bed utilizations going down 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 here we are here's our shipments now what we're going to be doing is monitoring these shipments and at the same time too looking at the IC bed levels and the inpatient bed levels now again there's a lot of confounding factors that could be involved but at least it gives us some insight better insight than just guessing right now most of our pandemic mitigation as you know has been just lucky rabbit's foot stuff or just guessing because it makes sense it works but in reality it's not really working that well at all so here we go I mean obviously we're still you know oh give us 15 days and we'll flatten the curve and give us 30 days give us a month we'll have it done by Easter all right so on and so forth you get the picture they're wrong every single 30 days they're totally wrong they're wrong in the fear aspects they're wrong in the mortality aspects they're wrong continuously not the scientists now they're wrong I'm trying to say people connected with the bureaucracy per se and it comes down to the selection bias going back to that article on da 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 do, 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 do. this is how I describe our bureaucracy just like this <laughs> they're not even thinking differently they're thinking of like one like the Borg is one sole unit and so obviously they're socially transferring on a regular basis and so here we go back to the data all right so you get the picture so let's go back to to do COVID states let's go masks all right I just didn't see this data yet Zimbabwe went to a level four in the mask now what the facial coverings is what they call it on a, a regular level so facial coverings when they go to the four that means it's mandatory so Zimbabwe now made it mandatory outside in the public um, as for example you see a zero that means Afghanistan for example has not even considered using masks uh, and so on and so forth so basically let's go down the line I don't know why that came out zero there we'll just go back down because obviously it's a four all right, there's our uh, basically our heat map to see if uh, facial coverings made a difference with anything. Did they make uh, deaths? 0.12, total deaths per million, 0.15. Pretty weak. And so overall, uh, do you see any 0.7s or negative 0.7s in any direction? No, I didn't think so. All right, so here we go. Da 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 yeah, we're, yeah, United States is a four. Oh, no one. It was showing up a zero because the dates. Uh, I forgot about that. So I was, I was messing with my head for a second. I was worried that there could be a problem with our data, but nope. Our, it was because it was in the beginning. There it is. We had a zero, and obviously that's back in January fifth. And of course, that was last year. So I saw January fifth. I was thinking this year, January fifth last year. Wow, has the world changed? All right, so here we are. These these are countries basically with a three. These are two, meaning just they're basically saying, "Hey, why don't you put a mask on?" And look at this. Sweden went to a one. Now that's important because Sweden was zero. So again, just focus on that. We'll see what's going on. All right, the United States as far as mass level didn't seem to make a difference. See, Sweden, what happened was the mask. The reason they didn't want to go for the mask in the beginning because basically they looked at people and they were touching their faces and things like that and so on and so forth. So what a one means, when you look at this, just to give you a heads up, means recommended but not required. So they probably have certain situations where they want to make sure that source control is in place. Uh, so I understand. So basically, Venatu and Nicaragua, still no facial coverings. And so, da-da-da... Da da. See, must just happen. It's like Happy New Year's. Here's a mask because they had a little spike in deaths. See right here. So they're just, they're not, they're just going whoa. Let's just say, hey, let's put a mask on. See what happens. Da da. Cases. 
again, that's interesting because I'm looking at data. Columbia, I'm not going to pay attention to anymore because of that. Japan, little spike in the rise. Uh, mass level. Doo -doo -doo. New Zealand, they're now playing. They got a mask at two, but again, not much outside of that. Do, 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 do. Cases per million. Look at that drop still. Finland. That's Finland. I don't know what to say. India. Um, yeah, again, don't know what to say. Let's go India, India, India. Spain. France. Just looking for anything uh, that's out of the ordinary. United Kingdom. Uh See, that's the thing. The mask aspect is an interesting aspect because, again, you tend to grab at straws. But when you look at the swings and things like that and the rises and the deaths between countries that do or do not, it doesn't seem to make much of a difference. All right. In fact, again, as we covered before, there's a hazard to the mask because if the virus, which already has been shown to be below 5 microns and you have – low airflow, I think it's 15 liters per minute, then you're going to have a greater what's called nasal disposition, which ironically can actually cause the virus to take hold in the nose at a higher level and potentially create greater infection. All right. And we have shown that SARS-CoV-2 is on the submicron level. I don't know how infectious it is at a submicron level, uh, but it's there. and We all know it. Italy... Again, you're not going to find any patterns on anything necessarily. What I do in there, nothing that. So let's go world data. All right, here we go. Uh, new cases smooth, new deaths. Remember, we're looking on a global scale. Mortality percentage of positive cases on a global level. It's winter time. Again, it's a weak correlation in my publisher bias. New cases smooth, new deaths. Not much mortality percentage, same going down. Uh, Great Britain, South Korea, Singapore, Sweden, and Great Britain, new cases moved per million. Nothing out of the ordinary. Uh, new cases smooth. Sweden, see, look up. This Sweden jumped up a little bit. And yeah, see what happened? Right there, even all of a sudden, it looked like there was a little bit of a jump during the winter time. So next week, we'll see what happens. And there we are. It's on par with the United States. But again, Sweden had did nothing, pretty much. This, even right now, all the treatments are coming out too. So there's that. And messing kennel cells, which we covered that, that. All right, which means investigate correlations. Do, do, do. There's the world, correlating the world with everything. You think extreme poverty plays a role with them? Um, now, it can be the, the human development index, it could be that they're not testing as much. But if you go to, let's say, extreme poverty, and you go to. Diabetes, age, GDP, capita, population, median life expectancy, life expectancy, new death smooth. Yeah, this is just too big. You're actually looking at new death smooth and extreme poverty. Negative. That's now normally, keep in mind, with other confounding factors, it's a negative correlation between extreme poverty and new death smooth. It has to do with reporting and things along those lines. But in a world where all things, if all things were equal, you would say, oh my gosh, extreme poverty seems to be an aversion for new death smooth. But again, it's not that easy and not that simple. Let's look at over the whole thing. Life expectancy, we looked at correlations, reference life expectancy, current case mortality. No correlation there still. Population density. Uh, this is going to go to the current ones. Still, no correlation. Uh, total cases per million. We looked at that before. I'm just going to run real through real fast until we get to Perkton stuff. Slovakia, new death smooth per million. As uh, Poland. But where is the U.S.? U.S. again was a 9.55. So last week it was at 7.9. When we first started doing this, it was at 3.6. So these are all the countries that are doing better than the U.S. And here we go. We uh, Let's get this back up there. So we got the United States in there too. Just maybe because it could be a rebounding issue. There's that. Yeah, because 
There's the United States. Oh, these are all the countries of the world doing better than the United States as far as new deaths per million. Per million. Just take that in. All right? And we're, we're maniacal, and we're going to keep on going with this. So let's see. Keep on going down the line. Now that's it. World mass, states recovering, population, house block occupancy. Done. I think we're probably done for tonight because I think, what, it's about 50 minutes? Yep, it's about our time anyways. So let's make a review real fast what we actually did check out. That's hanging out with happy people. What does that mean, hanging out with people which are – yeah, hang out with happy people. You know where I was going with that, but I stopped. All right, so let's go right to the beginning and see what we covered. You guys, this will make me happy in the beginning because there has been some incredible scientific breakthroughs. Again, this is a groundbreaking trial. I regret this should have been headline news. It's umbilical cord, uh, missing chemical cells. And again, I'm going to reiterate, to repeat, just two treatments, double-line study, 91% survival rate at one month. That's including people above the age of 85, obviously, uh, which are already past the life expectancy point. Incredible benefit uh, overall. One single umbilical cord can give enough therapeutic doses for 10,000 patients. Why is this not headline news? Mesenchymal stem cell infusions. 10,000 patients, two infusions, Greatly reduced hospital time and survival rate is phenomenal. FDA, I mean, you know, the FDA gave them fast track approval for some of the trials, but still, I would love to see that tomorrow. All right, next we cover it. Uh, yeah, that's the thing. So it explains, it could explain quite a bit that basically people feeling good can possibly transfer that feeling. Uh, this called stage presence or charisma, whatever you want to call it, and has nothing to do with looks. People have can have charisma regardless, even if they have a bag over their head, they can have incredible charisma. Even more challenging so that people are all covered up anyways. But at the same time too, fear and pain, those feelings can be transferred, even not rationalized. So people are suffering from depression and anxiety, you know, hanging around happy people can actually have some happy results. Wonderful pictures. Uh, and, of course, people that tend on behavioral engineering people into a position of not being happy. Uh, leverage national scarcity. Again, if you see any comments on that in regards to the news, you will know where that came from. CDC investigating, basically looking at the vaccine. Looks like they're reporting quite well. And, again, the main thing is, if anything, VARES, the Vaccine Adverse Event Reporting uh, System, Go to that. If there's anybody you know have a reaction, you'd be doing the world a ton of good if you decide to go that route. Again, Ralph Church Channel signing off. Gratitude. Thank you. Again, we do the regular uh, coverage, which I think this week will cover Ginger on Tuesday. But otherwise, if you're with me until 1.45 a.m., thank you. Gratitude. And again, also, too, when this publishes and premieres, I know a lot of people comment in the premiere, but by the time this actually processes and premieres, I'm probably asleep. So if you don't see me respond, it's not because I'm being indifferent or rude. It's because I'm just not there. So please forgive me in reference to that because it takes a while to get these done. And if I'm awake and I can do it, I definitely will. But if I'm asleep, I just don't do so much. But the takeaway, polyethylene glycol, polysorbate, you want to get the vaccine, the mRNA one, I really strongly recommend you get tested for those allergies. If you have those allergies, according to the CDC, not me, right there. No go. We're off to our channel. Thank you. Gratitude. See you all next time. Bye.